I'm Will Chamberlain. I'm Emily Jashinsky. I'm Ina Stepman. And I'm Josh Hammer. And this is NatCon Squad, where common good and common sense meet. NatCon Squad is produced by the Edmund Burke Foundation, the home for national conservatism. Subscribe now on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, today we got a pretty solid one. Um, Josh is going to talk about how the Democrats are out of touch on energy and, and uh, climate change. Um, Inez is going to talk about Trump saying that he has the right to, or should have more of a right at least, to fire civil servants. Um, Emily is going to talk about how Hispanics are walking away from the Democratic Party. And I'm going to talk about uh, what I've been seeing at the American First uh, Policy Summit, especially the fact that the foreign policy being espoused is pretty far from America first. Um, so, but first, let's let's go straight to Josh. Okay, great to be back with you guys. So I spent my column last week, my own Newsweek podcast this week, and large swaths of my radio fell in work this week talking about how out of touch the Democrats are. <laughs> because it's a, it, it's like kind of like an evergreen topic, but it, the past month or two has really, I think, just shined a spotlight on just how bad it is. And for, for what my money is worth, I think energy policy better encapsulates that, probably better than anything else. So as we discussed on this show, ad infinitum now, inflation is at a four-decade high. Inflation uh, last month, according to the CPI, was 9.1% annualized year over year. And you know, it, this is not like a high-end luxury good specific inflation. It's not like they're just hitting like your, your Hermes sandals or your Gucci pocketbooks, whatever. No, I mean, like the price of eggs year over year is up 33%. Uh, I, I personally don't eat eggs. I'm kind of a weirdo, but I, I know most Americans like their eggs. That, that hits pretty hard. I mean, gasoline prices obviously have now reached over $4 per gallon on average for the first time in American history. And it is just remarkable to me. It, it is really just remarkable that at a time of catastrophic inflation of stagnant wages, when every increased nominal dollar amount that goes to fund your food, and in particular your gasoline, because most Americans don't live in this COVID you know, Klaus Schwab, work from home, Zoom th kind of uh, environment. Most Americans have to get in their car or truck and actually go to work. Every dollar, every penny that you pay more at the pump is really going to take a tangible impact away from your ability to pay for your eggs, your chicken, whatever, your your day-to-day -day needs here. And the Democratic Party basically responds to this shouting from the American people for policy change by sticking two middle fingers. I mean, seriously, like earlier in the month of July, Joe Biden doubled down yet again on refusing to give out new drilling permits in Alaska and the Gulf of Mexico pertaining to America's hydrocarbon wellspring of resources that we realized over the course of the past 15, 20 years of the fracking shale revolution that we are so blessed to sit on so many hydrocarbons. Democrats avowedly refused to do that. This goes back to day one of Biden's administration. I mean, on day, literally on day one of his administration, he cannot wait till day two to cancel the Keystone XL pipeline because, I mean, that itself, I think, symbolically shows you just how much the modern Democratic Party is in the bag of the climate change radicals. But no, it's actually even worse than that. In fact, this month, literally as recently as, as last week, Joe Biden was openly flirting with the idea of a, of a climate change national emergency. At a time of ridiculously high gas prices, he's not just refusing to give out new drilling permits to expand supply, and we have an abundant supply. We're very thankful and blessed for that. He's going to—he's flirting with the idea of doing literally the precise opposite of that, notwithstanding the idea that greenhouse emissions from the U.S. constitute roughly 15 percent of global emissions, China and India. But really, kind of the money clip and the the clip that really got me just like almost you know spat on my cop when I saw this was Pete Buttigieg when he was when he, he's the transportation secretary, ridiculously unqualified by the way, the former mayor of South Bend, Indiana, a really crappy city. I've been to South Bend, not a particularly well managed city. He has no expertise whatsoever to be spouting off anything about transportation. But in any event, he was testifying before that the House Transportation. Um, excuse me, the, the House Transportation Infrastructure Committee last week. And he literally said, quote, the more pain that Americans feel at the pump, quote, the more benefit there will be for electric vehicle owners. And notwithstanding the fact that the average electric vehicle currently costs 82% of the, of the median American's household income. Just egregious, egregious, egregious stuff across the board here. So, um, you know, this is, a, this is a red meat topic. I doubt the four of us are going to disagree on this very much, but it, it's really just been grinding my gears, for lack of a better phrase. So I wanted to open the show with that. We would be curious for any of y'all's feedback to them. Well, 
I guess I'll jump in first. Um, it strikes me as what strikes me is how unserious this administration is about any of the things they want to do. So even laying aside, they might have radically different goals overall uh, than than the four of us would. They they aren't serious about getting to those goals, right? If if one of your goals is to punish Russia uh, and you don't want to work with Saudi Arabia, you need to be serious about American domestic production because people will not tolerate this kind of situation going forward. Of course, it's not purely because of the war. You know, gas prices were escalating very quickly before Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, but it certainly hasn't helped. But there, I, I bring it up only as the sort of fundamental unseriousness of the way they go about things. It's it, You're working backwards from a utopia that has never existed, right? That we can power America on, you know, unicorns and butterflies and, and solar and wind, right? And uh, that's just has never been the case it, even even in in sort of the best projections, it's never been the case that that, that is a future that's within reach. But they want um, to to bet it all on on that future because it works for their narrative and for a small percentage of their base. Uh, um, I'll I'll just add that uh, just to, to close. Climate change is a very niche concern in the American body politic right now. It's very very. Um, there is a small percentage of people who are very vociferous about it in, in the base of the Democratic Party, um, but it, it usually doesn't even rank in the top 10 of issues that the average American voter is concerned with. And that includes a lot of Democrats, by the way. There are a lot of Democrats who are way more concerned about the price at the pump than they are uh, about, you know, the, the uh, 20 or 30 year projections based on models that have already been wrong for a, a lot of, um, you know, have made a lot of wrong projections about climate in, in the past. So climate change really is one of those intensely sort of um, left wing woke urban concerns that doesn't translate even to the rest of the Democratic Party, uh, let alone to the American voter at large. And yet it's so central uh, to how the, this administration is doing things that they're willing, um, you know, to, to, to sort of, um, sacrifice or not think about um, all kinds of other important, uh, pr presumably important administrative goals like their foreign policy. It's quite interesting to see how the party that uh, has long purported to represent the working class is uh, wildly out of touch, both on cultural and economic issues. And obviously here on this podcast, we know there's overlap between the both of them. Um, but to see, you know, the party where Elizabeth Warren was on the debate stage saying Latinx um, also be the party that is trying, insistently trying, relentlessly trying um, to persuade people or trick people, uh, sometimes it's honest, sometimes it's not, into sacrificing for uh, a cause that doesn't seem to have a, a clear plan forward, you know, that doesn't seem to have a logical plan, plan forward, doesn't seem to have a, a consistent plan forward, and it requires all of these near-term near sacrifices that are incredible asks um, on the public. It has all of those asks for near-term sacrifices with really no clear or serious outline for what the long-term achievement actually is. And Pete Buttigieg really struggled, I think, to explain that in front of, for instance, Thomas Massey last week in Congress. Um, and so they, they really they really can't explain it. And I think that's a big tell. And it's a great example of how the Democratic Party's sort of um, priorities have shifted because its base has shifted, because this is this is not the party um, of the your, your sort of average blue collar working class person anymore. And, and you see that um, not just when they say things like Latinx, not just when they say things um, about media and race and culture. You also see that when they're talking about like hard dollars and cents, uh, kitchen table economics. Yeah, I mean, I, it's it's just that the Democrats are in this position where like to the extent they have you know, clearly defined goals, they're all mutually contradictory. Uh, they want gas prices to come down, but they want people to stop using gas. They want to play great power politics, but they want to not produce the, and not be energy independent and exporting energy to Germany. Uh, they don't, and so they, they're in this position where they're constantly talking out of both sides of their mouth, Biden pretending that, and, and pointing the blame at random people like, oh, it's the oil company's fault. Oh, it's the gas station owner's fault because he's not charging a low enough price for gas, even though they're the people who are, you know, they're, they're responding to the market. Um, and I think, I really think at core, you know, the, I, I was looking at, you know, what do Americans care about? There's a good Rasmussen poll on this. And it's like inflation, the economy, gas prices, like one, two, three. 
uh, just just hammering at home. And, it, and that's also a good reminder for us. Like sometimes we you know care about kind of more policy wonkish concerns, but you know average, normal people are just really fed up with high gas prices and 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 they point the blame at biden for good reason because the guy showed up in office and shut down an oil pipeline and shut it shut down some gas leases in the first few days in office and and they're reduced to lying about it so yeah they're they're just in horrible tension um a, an intelligent democratic party I, I don't think bill clinton would bill clinton at this point would just stop indulging the climate change people he'd tell them to go you know um, go what the kick rocks or something. I forget the exact name of the expression, but like a solid democratic politician who knew what they were doing would just tell the climate change people to take a hike and, and be like, guess what? We need to win. We're just going to stop paying attention to you. And what are you going to do Vote for the Republicans? Like, no, you're not. Um, but I don't think Biden or, you know, the, the rest of the people in the white house really have that sort of energy, uh, on their side. Uh, anyway. Go ahead. Yeah, so, Josh. Well, so yeah, real quick, just to wrap up here and then toss it to Inez for our second segment here. I just want to emphasize that from my perspective, arguably President Trump's most impressive domestic policy achievement was to make America a net exporter of, of, of oil and natural gas. That is really incredible. Going back as recently as 15 years ago, obviously, we were still importing huge quantities of oil from the Middle East, from Russia, Venezuela, you name it, and so forth. But all Biden had to do, basically, was not mess it up. That's literally all he had to do. And he obviously has done precisely that. But we're out of time on this segment, so let's toss it over to Inez. Um, yeah, so this is exactly one of those wonky issues that uh, Will was talking about that, but I think actually underlying is a very, very critical um, sort of uh, critical uh, sort of see that every single one of our politicians has to swim in and therefore affects things like energy independence. It affects um, basically every policy that a, a potential conservative administration would want to set. Um, I think after the four years of the Trump presidency, we're, we're really clear that essentially, whatever you want to call it, the administrative state, the deep state, um, what, what they're legally called the civil service, has a very strong perspective and they will use means both legal and illegal to thwart policy that they disagree with. So um, in, in the FEC filings from 2016, 95% of the donations, 95% um, uh, of the donations from federal employees went to Hillary. Right, it was 99% in the State Department. This is a, this is one of the the most politically skewed um, workforces in America. I mean, probably only the faculty lounge is more politically skewed. Um, and and you can fairly describe that bulk, that 2.8 million bureaucrats who never leave office. Depend, you know, um, doesn't matter who comes into the presidency; they can't be fired currently. Um, it's pretty fair to describe them as the branch of the Democratic Party that doesn't have the inconvenience of having to stand for election. Um, so that's that's the situation as stands. There's a reason that Republican administrations talk about like landing teams, like they're going into Omaha Beach, right? And it's because the bureaucrats oppose every idea they're going to try to implement. And we saw that in spades, um, especially with the Trump administration, because while that blob is a little more accepting of sort of the uniparty Republicans, um, it's very, very unaccepting of somebody like Trump. And I suspect, for example, it would also be a thorn in somebody like Bernie's side if Bernie were to become president, right? That there's a sort of um, sort of neoliberal left perspective of this blob whose jobs depend on it. And, and they actually make policy on everything from, you know, the definition of sex under the law uh, to foreign policy, the way they were hiding information from the elected president. Um, this is a massive problem. And so that's the backdrop to an Axios story that dropped late last week um, about how the Trump administration is going to bring back something called Schedule F um, or thinking about bringing back something called Schedule F, which was an, an idea they, they implemented late in the Trump presidency. And then obviously Biden reversed it. Um, but it's an attempt to classify uh, a, a little bit broader swath. Now we're still talking about maybe 50,000 out of two point. 8 million. So that, that should show you what a sort of drop in the bucket this is, but reclassify some of these federal employees as essentially the policymakers that they are. They are making policy decisions and they need to be directly responsible and accountable to the people that we elect, even if they don't like uh, those people or their policies. Um, and so this is this is a really important critical constitutional uh, reform, I think. But of course, it was not received that way uh, in in the media. It was um, it, it was it was received as though uh, we are going to turn into Venezuela. Uh, this is going to be a sort of rank political corruption. Um, and and just to respond to that, I mean, 
I, I, to my mind, um, most of these reforms that have locked in the jobs of civil servants have, the, the cure has been worse than the disease. It was an attempt initially in, in the late 1800s to uh, get rid of some of the political corruption that went along with the spoil system. Um, even though the spoil system included some of the best run administrations in American history, like Andrew Jackson's, Abraham Lincoln's, both aggressive users of the spoil system. Um, so it, it, you know, while it had its, its faults and its corruptions, it also produced some good administrations. Um, I think the cure is far worse, which is that we have millions of people with a very strong political perspective that is several standard deviations away from the American people. And there's no way to control them because you cannot promote them and you cannot fire them except on a very specific schedule and for very specific reasons. And so that's how you end up with a situation like Trump's where there were active um, conferences, public conferences of how uh, training civil servants, how to throw sand in the gears of whatever the Trump administration wanted to do. And they were very, very public about doing that. No Republican administration or conservative administration is going to be able to get a tenth of what they should get done get uh, done without serious civil service reform, which ultimately is probably going to have to come from Congress. But this is a, a good first step, and it is not like the the left is always screaming about. It is not a violation of our norms, and it's certainly not anti democratic. It is in fact a democratic reform that. Um, returns more power over a government to the American people and their elected representatives as opposed to unelected bureaucrats. And after the last two years, I think everybody should recognize how out of control uh, our unelected bureaucrats are. But to kick it back out um, after that that rant uh, to uh, the rest of um, the rest of NatCon squad, uh, what what do you think? Um, like Republicans should, how should Republicans deal with this issue? Because increasingly you have WAPO hits, you have um, the implications in the Axios story itself. This is going to be spun as uh, yet another violation of our democratic norms. You know, um, how, how should Republicans talk about this issue? How should they run on it? Um, and where should it, it sort of, um, how, where should it fall in, in our priorities? I guess would be the questions to throw out. It's definitely a violation of our like de facto norms that have been established really quickly over the course of the last 100 years. And uh, Jonathan Swan reported the story out for Access. He's a great reporter. And I saw some conservatives sort of chafing at his idea that this was radical. Um, no, constitutionally, it's not radical. What's radical is the administrative state and it's ballooning over the last century. But um, it is radical because of that. Um, and that's great because the country requires radical change to the administrative state. And that is abundantly clear. And average Americans understand that. Um, they may not understand the particulars of it because the media doesn't cover the particulars of it. They don't cover the changes to Title IX that Inez works so hard on um, stemming from basically personnel. Personnel is policy. And when you have so much personnel with the ability to make policy, you're going to get really terrible policy. Um, but I think they understand that Washington, D.C. is in desperate need of, quote, radical reform. So I don't think anyone needs to be uh, shying away from that label. In fact, I think radical reform is exactly what's in order. Um, and so I'll, I'll just, you know, underline absolutely everything that Inez just said. Um, and I think I, I don't think there's any reason for Republicans to worry about being smacked with that label, because I think uh, plenty of voters will say, heck, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll just go uh, quickly. Uh, personnel is policy. Uh, you can't get your policies enacted if the people who are charged with enacting them hate you and hate everything you're doing. Trump found that out. Um, clearly, I, I think the Schedule F stuff doesn't go far enough. We need to be able to be in a position to fire more civil servants. Uh, their jobs are far too cushy and they're far too insulated um, from, from any sort of termination. That much is obvious. Uh, if you haven't watched Yes Minister, I highly commend that to everybody here. Uh, the English sitcom from the 70s is still, it's about politics. It's about bureaucrats um, essentially making, spinning, uh, you know, like just making fools out of the politicians who are supposed to be responsible for controlling them. Um, civil servants have permanent careers. The politicians are going to be gone in a few years. That's always the dynamic at play. And just in general, I mean, I think, you know, and I, I think, you know, Inez is right. Well, you know, the general public maybe is not particularly obsessed with civil service regulations. They don't care either way. And they're perfect. They're not going to care about the Democrats being like, they're destroying democracy. I mean, you just translate our, uh, you know, we're our democracy to our oligarchy. You understand exactly what's going on. Anyway, I'll kick it over to Josh. Yeah, I just have two points to make, because uh, I certainly agree with the premise of Inez's tossing to the panel and the gist of all of her criticisms. One is from a narrow 
constitutional perspective here. The idea that the president of the United States does not have full and plenary power to fire every single subordinate that he wants to fire in the executive branch is lunacy. Um, I mean, to like literally just go like full textual for a moment here, Article 2, Section 1, Clause 1, the Constitution, the vesting clause of Article 2, that's the quote unquote executive power in a president of the United States, period, full stop, end of story. Not in the president of the United States and his cabinet officials, not in the president of the United States and his undersecretaries of HHS or HUD or whatever. No, it is in the president of the United States. And there's been a wealth of scholarship that I think quite persuasively shows that one of the quintessential executive functions is the ability to fire subordinates. So that's that really, it's, it's one of the, the defining characteristics of what the executive power is. It's kind of the same way that one of the defining characteristics of private property is the right to exclude, is the right to kind of prevent from coming on there. That's kind of a defining characteristic of private property. So is the right to fire a subordinate, I would argue, a defining characteristic of executive power. The other point, though, that I want to make is this Axios piece was, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. You know, a lot of friendly names in there. Our, our, uh, our, our frequent co-host, of course, Rachel Bovard, got a small shout out as well. Um, American Moments, where Rachel and I are on the advisory board, got a nice little section in, in this article. So I would encourage the listeners and viewers to go read the whole article there. But I, I'm happy to see that this effort is happening to the extent and breadth that is happening. I obviously knew a lot of these moving parts were happening. I didn't quite realize how in sync a lot of these various orgs were together. Because I think what I want to briefly underscore, and then we'll go to the next segment here, is the Trump administration did not do a good job of this, to put it mildly. If, if there was really one failing that Trump administration had, it was with, it was with respect to personnel, failure to hire people who are mission aligned, and just generally a failure to kind of cleanse and purge the deep state. I mean, Trump campaigned a lot on draining the swamp, and he was correct to do so, but he proved remarkably incapable, I think, of doing that. And a lot of the folks that I talk to about 2024, when I hear folks who are kind of sick of Trump, it's usually they're sick of him less so because of the January 6th committee nonsense. They're, they usually, at least to me, what I hear is that he, you know, he couldn't execute on his vision because he was the guy who famously said, like, you're fired on TV a million times, was actually incapable of getting in there, whether it's for legal constraints, norm constraints, whatever, of actually doing what has to be done. But we're, we're at time on this segment, so let's toss it over to Emily. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Um, we're going to be talking about in this segment uh, the the way Hispanic voters or patterns of Hispanic Americans, voting patterns of Hispanic Americans are shifting. Uh, President Trump uh, just referenced this in a speech this week where he said, I believe he said something like Hispanic voters are cascading towards the GOP. Um, and it, it is really interesting. We've we've talked, I know, a little bit about Myra Flores, who won a big race in a uh, in a traditionally democratic stronghold down in the Rio Grande Valley that sort of went along with patterns of voting in 2020 that saw Hispanic voters in the Rio Grande Valley shifting to vote Republican um, in an interesting trend. And there's been a lot of reporting on this over the summer. Um, I have a report up from the Hill in front of me that are talking about a New York Times Santa College poll. It found that only 41% of Hispanics said they intended to vote for Democrats in the upcom upcoming midterms, Well, 38% said they preferred preferred GOP candidates. The Republican Party has sort of seen this happening and is now working in overdrive to reach out to Hispanic voters, particularly in districts where they think uh, there are vulnerabilities for Democrats. We saw this with, um, you know, the, the Cuban vote is traditionally fairly Hispanic, or fairly, fairly Hispanic, yes, it is uh, fairly Hispanic, but it's fairly uh, friendly to the Republican Party. Um, but we've seen more Hispanics from uh, different backgrounds, be they Venezuela, Venezuelans um, or Cubans or Mexicans uh, interested in the Republican Party, voting for the Republican Party. Um, there are different reasons. <clears throat> but one, uh, I think, important theory is that Republicans have, in their outreach to Latino voters, successfully uh, compared democratic policies to socialism um, and to, you know, the state organization of the economy, to cultural socialism in terms of censorship and harsh restrictions um, on, you know, cultural activities, whatever it is. And frankly, Democrats are less popular than ever with uh, working class voters period, uh, whatever sort of racial background they come from. Uh, we've seen a little bit on on this uh, with uh, black voters as well, sort of chipping away. Um, that's That will be a really difficult work for the Republican Party. Um, but 
that's not impossible. And, you know, small differences actually can matter uh, in close elections. So that is to say that the Republican Party does seriously uh, appear to be making pretty decent inroads uh, with Hispanic voters. It's not just Myra Flores. Um, it's also Glenn Youngkin uh, made really big inroads with the Hispanic vote in Virginia in an election that was heavily cultural, that was heavily about uh, the takeover of schools. For years, Republicans have said that, you know, Hispanic voters are a natural GOP constituency. I don't know that that's actually turning out to be true. I think the the reasons that Hispanics might be shifting to Republicans are different um, from what a lot of people found or believed at the time. I think this is a reaction to Democratic Party extremism. Um, but it's a serious trend to keep an eye out for in a, in a midterm election cycle because it could be durable and it could matter not just it will matter this year, but it could matter beyond this year and it could speak to the broader re alignment. Uh, so I'll toss it open to the group with that uh, kind of context about where this is now and where it could go going forward. Yeah, all we had to do was stop putting up, you know, uh, hedge fund and private equity types talking about the need for entitlement reform. And all of a sudden, we started winning some Hispanic votes, you know, it's like, <laughs> I just, I remember that, the, you know, the the sort of autopsy of, of 2012, when we lost to Obama the second time, and it was all about, well, we just we need to be, you know, liberal on immigration, more socially, you no, know, more like standard socially conservative, and nothing to. We're not going to talk at all about economics, right? That's not. It's like no, actually, you need to, you need to go the Trump direction. You don't want to go, you don't want to go to socialism, but you need to kind of come middle of the road on economics and and not certainly stop talking about entitlement reform and the things that, uh, like and, um, you know, the estate tax and all the, you know, this stuff that uh, establishment Republicans have been focused on for decades. Um, yeah, I think that combination, along with the Democrats going crazy woke, which is just completely antithetical to Hispanic, you know, like American Hispanic culture, that's just not a part of it. Um, and it's again, there's this, I think one of the things Republicans can really exploit is that, you know, overall Republican voters as a whole are, are kind of mostly on the same page when it comes to this stuff. They're just, they're anti-wokeness, they're, they're all, everybody sort of agrees, whereas you have in the Democratic Party coalition, this fundamental tension between the weirdo woke types and then the working class people who are supposed to be like the base of the party. Now, now we're getting those people. And I think, you know, you'll, I think we're going to beat the, Dem I think in 2022, I think we're going to beat them in the Hispanic vote. And I think we're going to beat them again in 2024, assuming we nominate um, a DeSantis or Trump. Uh, as long as, you know, as long as we nominate like uh, someone with some, some gusto, we're going to, we're going to win the Hispanic vote. So, uh, I, I mean, I certainly agree with with the thrust of Will's comments there. And, you know, this, this has been slowly trending for a long time, especially over the past year or so. There was some Wall Street Journal polling last December. I'm sure there's been more recent polling. You just can't cite off the top of my head that showed that on like the generic R versus D ballot, uh, the Latino vote could easily break Republicans way nationwide. I, I, I certainly am cautiously optimistic that the Latino vote here in Florida, where I live, will will go for DeSantis over Nikki Fried or Charlie Chris, whoever they nominate for the governor race. This fall, the Florida Hispanic vote obviously is a little more complicated, large Cuban presence, uh, Colombian, Venezuelan. But you know, I think in 2018 and 2020, actually, when Trump defeated Biden in Florida, if I remember the exit polling data correctly, it wasn't just the Cuban vote that swung the Trump. I think it was the Colombian vote, the Venezuelan vote. And you know, I was speaking here at a Florida conference this past weekend, the Florida GOP's so-called Sunshine Summit just up the road in Hollywood. And I made a very similar point to what Emily just made, actually, in, in her presentation of the seven, which is I think Republicans have been very successful at framing a lot of what the left wants to do as having strong socialist tendencies or just being outright socialism. And, and that's not a particularly far stretch of the imagination because you really only have to listen to what folks like AOC and Bernie Sanders are sometimes saying. Bernie Sanders freaking honeymooned in the USSR, for God's sake. I mean, I mean, are you kidding me? I, I mean, like if you are coming here, if you are fleeing a, a, a Venezuela or a Colombia, if you are dealing with quadruple digit hyperinflation under Hugo Chavez or whatever in Caracas and you get here to Florida, like, are you really going to vote for the party of Bernie Sanders. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. But, uh, you know, the other thing that this segment really directly relates to was my segments open up the show, which is just how the Democratic Party, which I think once upon a time did care about the tangible day to day concerns. I mean, I'm not like an FDR New Deal or anything, but at least they purport to talk and care about the day to day, you know, expansive welfare state pro labor union, et cetera, day to day working class concerns. 
they just don't really focus on that stuff anymore. I mean, you know, this is why my own deputy editor and Newsweek, Badia, who is like literally a socialist, Badia still calls herself a socialist, but you know, she can't deal with the Democratic Party because they don't talk about those economic issues anymore. The party of FDR, LBJ is just simply no more. And you know, the current electorate of the Republican Party is increasingly looking more downscale, you know, high school education, less PhDs, less college education in general. So if you're kind of getting here, you know, fresh off the boat. Whether it's um, you know fresh off the Mexican border down in kind of uh, Maya Flores district in Texas or down here in Florida from Venezuela or Cuba, whatever, why would you turn to the Democratic Party? It just doesn't make sense anymore. Um, so just to agree and underline some of the things that have been saying, uh, the autopsy was backwards, right? Uh, the 2012 autopsy was backwards. They said we need to appeal to minority voters, including Hispanics, by dropping cultural issues and focusing on economics um, to the extent that. Uh, it's pretty much the reverse that's true and, and then adjusting the economic policies. Um, and, and what Josh just said is totally true. The base of the Democratic Party now is college educated, um, essentially professional managerial class types, whether they work in government or academia or in the private sector. And, and that's just not the priorities of that base are not going to be aligned with working class voters priorities, including Hispanics. The second point I wanted to make is that despite all of the sort of rage around racial issues in America, we're actually seeing a depolarization of the vote along racial lines. Um, and, and I think that speaks to how far off the concerns of, say, like the, the woke left are uh, compared to the concerns of Americans of all different racial backgrounds. So I just think it's, it's an interesting thing to note that, that while we are having um, all of these increasingly insane racial discussions um, and wanting to teach, uh, for example, critical race theory in, in American classrooms, actually the American electorate is depolarizing around race as a political matter. Um, and, and third, and just this is sort of a note for establishment Republicans, particularly um, in, in DC and, and in and around the Hill, they tend to imagine that the Overton window is the size of a stamp, right? But the speed with which this is is shifting in the electorate because we're talking huge flips in vote um, in among Hispanics within like two election cycles, right? Um, the speed with which this is happening should be a reminder to people who always want to play within the same two goalposts, and usually those goalposts are set by the left, right? Um, and they're sort of progressively moved leftward, uh, it, it's a reminder that actually you don't have to play within those two goalposts. Um, the, the speed with which the American electorate can change its mind on an issue or change parties is, is completely you know, mind blowing. And it should be a huge reminder to people who are always wanna be stuck in exactly the last, like sort of stuck within the, the political spectrum that, that is you know, just about the width of, like I said, of a postage stamp. Um, that's that's not actually a successful way to do politics and it may not even be a popular way to do politics i think it's proving to be a very unpopular way to do politics so cool 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 well uh my segment well i went to the i don't know if you can see this the america first agenda conference yesterday i'm probably gonna head back today honestly just head over to watch go watch trump speak um but yesterday i attended a foreign policy uh panel with Senator Joni Ernst, Senator Bill Haggerty, Representative Mike Waltz were the, the main panelists. And then the moderators, there were two of them, it was General Keith Kellogg and uh, John Ratcliffe, the former DNI. Um, and you know, this is the America First Policy Institute, right? This is supposed to be the, the vanguard of Trumpism or nominally the vanguard of Trumpism. But it was, that panel was one of like the most depressing panels I've seen in a long time because it was, a panel with unanimous support for effectively open-ended uh, funding and support for Ukraine to try and win the war in Ukraine um, on the part of America without sending any troops. And I just thought, listening to them, they had no clue. They had, they had no idea. They were like, we need to win. OK, well, what does winning look like? Are you planning to march into Moscow? No, well, we just want to send all the Russian troops home bloody. And well, we need to, but we need to be accountable for the money we send. So we need to send American troops on the ground to watch that money. That was Rep Waltz's idea. Um, Joni Ernst talked about uh, the need to, again, to, that her goal was like all the Russian troops bloody and, and leaving. Um, they, more weapons, more money spent. And, you know, I'm sitting here thinking like above them is sitting the America first policy, America first agenda, like in highlights. And you're just, you're like, what are you people doing? I mean, this is, this is stuff that could have easily been said during the Bush administration. This is, it's as if like, 
you know, what, and in fact, President Trump himself said that he was shocked that, you know, that, that we were sending 40 billion in aid to Ukraine. Um, so, and, and moreover, it's, it's funny because you think that, you know, later on, they're talking about the need to confront China, China being the most dangerous threat we've ever faced, blah, 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 blah. And yet they're talking about an open-ended, uh, infinite commitment to funding the Ukraine war. Um, and no talk of like, how are we going to bring it to an end outside of somehow we're going to win despite sending no troops, just more, more money and material will lead to Ukraine winning somehow. We don't know. Uh, nothing about it seemed America first to me. None, nothing about it seemed like they had, the people on the stage had taken, taken any lessons from the Trump presidency or, you know, where their base was. And it's just these, and, and you know, it's funny, like they didn't take any questions at the end of it, obviously, but like, it's the where where the GOP leg, you know congressional caucuses and where the legislators are. It's so completely divorced from the concerns of the base on foreign policy. Uh, it's it's still really it's really shocking and and it just makes me worry. I think, you know, I, I hope that Trump isn't going to take this this line if he is reelected. I certainly hope DeSantis doesn't agree with this nonsense. I don't think he does, but. I'm really, I'm just really glad these people don't run the executive branch and I don't want them anywhere near any sort of this power. But, um, you know, I'll, I'll open up what, what you guys, to hear what you guys think about all this. I, I'm, I'm happy to jump in here. So yeah. I, I don't, uh, I, I agree with the thrust of your criticisms for sure, Will. Um, the, the AFPI is where Brooke Rollins is the president, right? If I'm not yeah. mistaken here. Yeah. Okay, look, I, I, I I'm not going to go like Ed Hominem here, but I but I have longstanding reason to not necessarily always trust that Brooke has kind of the 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 best instincts. So Texas Public Policy Foundation, when she was president before Kevin Roberts, who's now the president of Heritage, was president, they kind of pioneered the so-called Right on Crime Initiative, which was led by at the time by the other Mark Levin, the lesser known Mark Levin. So at the time, TBPF, uh, back when Rick Perry was governor of Texas, then into the Abbott administration a little bit, really kind of was the ones to kind of get out there with this um, this jailbreak initiative to kind of reduce sentences, stuff that I have written, spoken about voluminously at great length over the years. So, you know, I I, I was I, then Brooke Rollins, you know, she goes to the Trump White House. What do you know? The First Step Act ends up being kind of the second major piece of domestic legislation under President Trump after the, you know, the corporate supply side tax cut from 2017. So, um, you know, I, I wasn't there at the conference. It sounds like based on um, the tweets that I've seen, what you've just said, that that a lot of the lessons were were not properly learned. I, I, I'm, I'm very curious for Inez's thoughts because I think there might be some mild disagreement here among us. But for, for what my money is worth, I've written a couple of columns on Ukraine now. My stance as to what U.S. position on Ukraine should be at this juncture, where I think more U.S. aid was... Quite, quite possibly, in fact, probably justified at the beginning of the conflict when it look when it looks like the Zelensky regime might actually legitimately fall. Um, but that's just simply no longer the case. I mean, we've had high-ranking grandees, officials from both political parties who have now been to Kiev. They have now been there. Uh, Zelensky's not going anywhere. Um, and, and you know, it, it, that is better for the U.S. national interests. That as corrupt a country as Ukraine is, and is profoundly corrupt. Zelensky is still better than a Putin-style puppet, which is what you have with Lukashenko in Belarus, right to Ukraine's north. So I think Zelensky is preferable to a Belarusian-style Russian puppet state for sure. The key point to make, though, is that that's no longer really in doubt. Right now, they're fighting over Crimea, which you know Russia has basically been in for eight years now, since 2014, when Putin marched in under Barack Obama. And then, of course, um, Luhansk and Donetsk, these two subregions that comprise the Donbass of eastern Ukraine. And like, you know, look from, from from an American perspective, do I really, really agree with signing off on 40 to 50 billion dollars on on who should control the Donbass region between the Ukrainians and the Russians over like a country that Ukraine that isn't even in NATO? I mean, no, of course not. It's it's crazy, crazy stuff here. Um, Henry Kissinger was slapped around by Vladimir Zelensky when he called for something along the ooh, I don't know if you guys heard that. It's a big thunderstorm here in Florida right now. <laughs> uh, um, I, I lost a train of thought. Sorry. Um, Kissinger got in a lot of trouble with, with Zelensky when he was talking about the need to kind of get real politique involved and come to the negotiating table. I think he was exactly right. I mean, certainly from an American national interest perspective at this point, I see no particular reason to double down this militant rhetoric. We're going to kill the Russians, get them out of the Donbass. I mean, seriously, like, who the hell cares? I'm sorry, but I, I, I genuinely do not care who controls the Donbass in particular. Zelensky's not going anywhere. That's what matters. Well, it's funny considering how many wars turn out to be long wars that no one ever plans for 
the war to be short. I mean, no one ever plans for the war to be to, to drag on, right? Every every war before it starts is going to be a short war, and very few wars are short. Um, I, I I think a couple things I would add to what Josh said. Uh, first, it should be, and I've read the opposite, which is why I'm making it clear. I've read a lot of people write the opposite um, that it is it is Ukrainians and not just Zelensky, but from all accounts, to the extent that it's possible to derive um, sort of national will during a war, it, it, Ukrainians do not want to give up sovereignty. And the reason that they don't want to do that is because this war will continue. Um, and, and it's not going to be a stable situation where, where Putin gets Donetsk and, and gets like parts of the East and then sits back. I mean, we're already seeing what's happening in Moldova. Um, th this is just, it's kind of like the, uh, the ceasefire in the Israeli context, right? It's just a, an opportunity to regroup, rearm and continue the war. Um, and, and I think that's their understanding uh, of, of what they're facing over there. I think it's probably correct, but I'm not an expert on it. Um, that being said, Obviously, America needs to make its own independent uh, determination of national interests and what Americans are willing to do um, to, to back Ukrainians in this war. I think that it's one one thing that I, I will sort of cede to, I think, um, Josh's side and Will's side of this debate is that we do need to have an independent debate, right? Um, and it's it's not right uh, to, to censor, for example, which has happened. I know that um, the Ukrainian ministry like put a list of Americans, including Glenn Greenwald. Right, you can disagree yeah. with this war without being pro Putin, or, or certainly without being, um, you know, sort of a traitor yeah. country. Right, that that's not that's not a helpful discourse. Yeah, that, that um, should have led to uh, the foreign minister being called and told they need to pull down that list or they can stop receiving funding. And we're not going to have them telling us about any American citizens who are you know disloyal or parroting Russian propaganda. They can knock that off. Right now. Sorry, there, to there are people parroting Russian propaganda, yeah. but actually, the list of people that, as far as I've read, has not yeah. been that. But also, I mean, this list doesn't have any actionable uh, consequences in America, and it shouldn't. But um, what I would, what I would, I guess, caution is that remember, for example, that the majority of the American people, and even the majority of Americans, still very strongly support Ukraine in this war. Um, that may change as the war grows longer and longer and requires more and more sacrifice. Um, and, and again, I return to the point, I guess, of the unseriousness of the way that we're prosecuting both this war and our domestic policy. If we want to actually uh, be able to stand against Russia geopolitically, we have to drill at home. That is literally the only major key that they have and the way that they, the, you know, and the fact that they can cut off gas to Europe is, is pretty much the only big tool in Putin's toolbox. And yet, you know, we have all of this wild rhetoric about supporting Ukraine um, from the Biden administration and absolutely, you know, and $40 billion, a lot of which has not actually gotten to Ukraine. And, and there's a long story with that. But, um, you know, it, it's again, it shows the fundamental unseriousness. If you want to set this as part of your foreign policy, and I actually, in this case, I agree, I think this should be part of our foreign policy within limits um, to support Ukraine in this war then you have to actually be serious about doing it. You can't imagine that Americans are going to pay $7 a gallon at the pump indefinitely, or that Europe is going to have no gas this winter. Like you have to be serious about the decisions that you're making. Um, and then the final thing I would say is Americans are not ideological about foreign policy. Sorry, guys, they're not in my camp. They're not in your camp. Americans are very um, sort of changeable. And, and uh I think they're more Jacksonian than anything else on foreign policy. And I suspect that American public opinion will disappoint each and every one of us on foreign policy at some point because it's not stable. Um, and I think that's something that's really important to remember. I think a lot of the sort of new right America first stuff, not just on foreign policy, but on a lot of things that we get excited about, um, we have to remember that <laughs> we're still like, like very wonky or whatever and Americans reserve the right to be pragmatic and change their minds. I'll say I think this conversation, not to sound cheesy, is a good sign in and of itself that uh, progress is being made. Whether or not that's enough uh, is a different question. But I do think that, you know, the the uh, Republican Party, the conservative movement of five, ten years ago, uh, there wouldn't be a lot unless it was sort of in the Ron Poor. Ron Paul corridors, there would not be a lot of dissent or pushback to panels like the one Will just sort of broke down for us that had this kind of 
abjectly uh, pro-war rhetoric or pro-military industrial complex rhetoric. Um, there have been some interesting votes that have uh, taken place throughout the war in Ukraine where you do have some sort of like populist votes coming from uh, Republicans. Um, so I think just the signs are, in, you know, that we're, we're headed in the right direction, which is that there is nuance extremely to this conversation and that the sort of just pro-military industrial complex rhetoric of the Republican Party from the Bush years um, is not well placed anymore. Uh, so to the extent that there's a silver lining and there's positive news, um, I, I certainly agree with Will that there's still a, a lot to, you know, sort of disabuse. There are a lot of notions to disabuse some Republicans of um, going forward. But I think the the positive sign is that the, the conversation is at least happening. And that's more than we could say for the Obama or Bush eras. Fair enough. All right. Um, let's go around the room and do final thoughts. Start with Josh. Rapid fire, I guess. Okay. Well, yeah. um, we're recording this on Tuesday. So I published a Newsweek, a great column today from Gordon Chang, who we run twice a month on China related issues. Gordon has a piece up at our site today that talks about a story that I think has kind of flown under the radar a bit, which is a Chinese company by the name of Fulfang Group, if I remember the name correctly which is purchasing hundreds of acres of property, which also coincidentally happens to be 12 miles away from a sensitive United States Air Force base in the middle of North Dakota. And this Chinese company is trying to put in a corn milling operation there. But because of it, it is like it is flat, it is, it is, it is the prairie, and there is all sorts of kind of anecdotal evidence to the effect that China you know, it's a nominally independent company, emphasis on nominally, because in the Chinese Communist Party's top-down political economy, there really is no such thing as a truly nominal company. And the point that Gordon makes in his column for me is actually Article 7 and 14, if I remember the, the citation correctly, of China's national security law actually can compel, can effectively kind of a commandeer reportedly private companies to do the Communist Party's dirty work with respect to espionage and things like that. So, well, you know, translation to kind of break away from the legal lease for a bit. This looks like a Chinese Communist Party surveillance operation happening in the North Dakota prairie. And this is starting to get more information. You know, I saw the uh, Charlie Kirk's Turning Point Summit with, uh, here in, in in Florida and Tampa this past weekend. I, I saw them talk about this a little bit, but we we need a serious response with respect to what what appears to be just huge swaths of acreage that China and Chinese affiliated businesses are buying up. This is kind of Ben's topic. Ben's off this week, but Ben, I'm sure, would have a lot to say on this. And that, that has to happen. I mean, we need a policy response that should just, I mean, maybe extremely limited dispensations, probably not, honestly. I mean, I, there should be like a flat across the board ban on any of these companies that have Chinese Communist Party affiliations whatsoever buying any property whatsoever. So I was happy that Gordon wrote about it. I would encourage you guys to check out the piece on Newsweek up this week. I guess I'll, I'll hop in with my final thoughts. Um, I wanted to say a word about democracy. And I, I think um, it's one of the most abused words in our discourse today. Everything is, is sort of a violation or a threat to democracy, including decisions like Dobbs that actually restore an issue to democratic control. Um, and, and I think while Will is right to say earlier and during my segment that, you know, sort of schedule F, how many employees get, uh, civil servants get like put into schedule F is not uh, necessarily of concern uh, to the American people at large. I, I do think the public cares about the sense that, and, and feels intensely how detached our government and our governing class has gotten uh, from the American people. And I think that that itself is actually the energy underlying um, a lot of, of um, both the success that Trumpism and the new right has had, but also just the, the um, broad support that we're seeing even across party lines for some of these cultural issues and so on. It's, it's a loss of faith, as Emily and I have talked about many times, a loss of faith with institutions. And, and underlying that is the idea that these institutions, even those that are supposed to be you know, running um, our, our representative republic are totally detached from the people. And I do think that that's really like, that is a critical um, underlying understanding of, to, to getting anything about our politics today. And then I'll just, I'll just briefly um, make two points about the civil service stuff. Um, 
to points that both Emily and Will made respectively. One, I don't know that I call it, maybe it is radical, but it's radical on the basis of, of norms that have only been established over the last 30 years, not the last 100 years. You know, the Pendleton Act was, was well over 100 years ago, but um, it's really only norms for the last 30 years. The last major civil service reform came from Jimmy Carter, um, and, and Reagan attempted some, some civil service reforms. Um, so this is, this is not a, like, outside of living memory kind of thing. Um, this is really, once again, one of those uh, convenient conflations of the norms of liberal democracy with the basic tenets that both of members of the Uniparty, both sides of the Uniparty have agreed on for 30 years that have just been conflated with the word democracy, right? Um, and, and then third, there are limits to executive action. I'm really curious to see where this Schedule F thing goes. Um, Trump's previous EOs on this subject were struck down, I think probably rightly, um, by the courts in large part. This really is something Congress needs to act. Congress has put all of these um, two layering systems, actually there are two separate protection systems. You can sue in one and then you can sue in the other if you get fired. It's like literally civil court level proceedings in two different systems in the federal government. Um, this is a mess that Congress has created. And, and I think pointing to some of the reforms that Jimmy Carter made um, might be a, a good bipartisan sort of suggestion to let the left call Jimmy Carter an anti-democratic like anti or radical uh, because he wanted to actually control the executive branch as the elected president. Well, the uh, <clears throat> I guess the 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 similarities are uh, the similarities in our conversation both about Will and Inez's topics. Um, I think is that there are cracks in the foundation uh, more than we've seen. Right, like that. You know, this isn't just the the Ron Pauls or the Glenn Greenwalds of the world uh, anymore. These ideas, and this would be horrifying to any of our maybe neoconservative neo or neoliberal uh, listeners, these ideas have been mainstreamed. Uh, and the Republican Party, I think, is doing a better is doing a better job of listening to populist concerns about the existing structure of the economy and the culture. But uh, as this this podcast often, I think, uh, demonstrates itself, the cracks in the foundation are really serious, uh, whether they're durable, whether the foundation itself can, you know, fight back and r repair itself to the uniparty uh, that Inez just referenced is a completely open question. And both Will and Inez as subjects and Inez, you have the corporate media, um, you know, sort of casting this plan uh, as something that, you know, is a what, what's the right word, like a really big threat to normalcy, whatever. Um, and in Will's subject, we saw you know, even, quote, America first Trump loyalists. Um, and this was one of the most interesting battles that played out in the Trump administration in and of itself with Syria, with other foreign policy decisions engaged in this tug of war ideologically. Um, and the fact that that tug of war is even happening, I think is a really good sign, not to sound cheesy, because I know that does make me sound cheesy um, and it seems like a cop out, but just thinking back of the last you know, 10 years, these conversations weren't really happening um, you know, outside of Ron Paul circles. And uh, you know, Rick Santorum ran on some of this from the cultural perspective and was basically laughed out of the primary. Uh, so you know, the, the, the fact that the conversation is happening, it's, I guess, a, a step in and of itself, but it's not, I think, a cause uh, for or uh, too much optimism just because we have seen the, the fight back from the other side uh, coming out strong. Yeah, I guess I have two quick final thoughts. One is sort of along Emily's lines. Like, I, I really think it's important, especially with Trump out of power, that, you know, the, the nationalist wing of the conservative movement take power, hence why we're all here doing national conservatism, right? I, I, I really do not want to see uh, the neoconservatives return to power. Most of them are now Democrats, right? You know, Bill Kristol and the like. But um, I don't want to see that ideology come back. If anything, it's a part of the reason I, you know, re got back into politics, you know, for was because Trump pushed back so hard on, on stuff I thought was ridiculous. Um, and the second thing is uh, just a completely different tack, but along Josh's lines, I, I had the privilege of being in a part of actually a good part of the American First Policy Summit, which was Steve Yates had a very interesting China discussion um, with Robert Lighthizer, who was the trade representative. And he said some very interesting stuff about, you know, and, and sort of very interesting arguments for broad-based tariffs on Chinese goods. Um, he talked about the idea of strategic decoupling. It's not to say we're completely disconnected from China, but the idea of broad-based tariffs is we become more disconnected 
and we only keep those things we absolutely need and we, we start incentivizing anybody else to be the winner in the marketplace. And, and the idea that tariffs are actually, if you are trying to strategically decouple from China, the most elegant free market way to solution because you're not actually picking winners or exactly what industry you get. You're just saying China needs to lose and other people should win, right? We don't know who among those other people and you can have some sort of immersion order around that, but uh, it's instead of like trying to subsidize a particular industry or what or a particular company, you just say broad-based tariffs on Chinese goods and let the market shake it out after there. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, anyway, that is what we have. Um, thank you so much. I think, uh, hope you guys enjoyed NatCon Squad.